So we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, lecture for the day. So Monday, again, that was a uh, bunch of in-class exercises. So we're going to review some of the stuff that, that was in the videos, just run through the slides that they had very quickly. And then I'm going to use the slides to introduce uh, two new concept, a few new concepts. Uh, the main thing that we want to introduce today are how we work with uh, strings and how we work with scanner and how we deal with uh, returning values. So three things that we want to get to today. But first, we'll start by reviewing uh, stuff. And remember, there will be another. I'm going to try recording some extra lectures tonight or on Thursday, so that we can, uh, so that I'll, so that we'll have another, uh, you know, in-class exercise period on on Monday. Again, you're expecting if I if I'll record those videos, I'll make an announcement about it, and you'll be expected to watch those videos. There will be like they'll. It, there shouldn't be much more time than an actual lecture, and I'll try to split them up into logical things so that you can watch some, some one video, then go and do something else, and then watch another, because they'll only be 15 minutes long, and 15 minutes is really easy to pay attention to, right? That's kind of the limits of, of our ability to pay attention, which is unfortunate that we do these hour long and frame lectures and why I want to get uh, away from them. All right, and again, for the Japan students, for these in-class uh, lectures, I'll for these in-class exercises. I'll post them online. You just need to work on them and submit them. A lot of these we will, will just be submitting and uh, for, you know, for, the part, for participation purposes, just to make sure you're practicing and working on these things. All right. Um, also, um, last thing is that the first exam, so first off, we have a first, a first time lab on Friday, right? So that shouldn't be any different. So that one isn't going to be much, uh, more different than the the difficulty of the uh, of the exercises on that will be on par with the difficulty of the first three exercises of lab of uh, the four loop lab. Okay, so you know printing out ninety nine bottles of beer on the wall. So doing something where you basically you just have to print out numbers. That's fairly straightforward. Drawing a very very simple one of the, like uh, one of the like very very simple ASCII art things, like something that's really simple, okay? Not not like anything that we did in class, okay? Where basically there's a lot of things that change. It's going to be very simple to test these kind of things out. So, um, but if you can do well on the first three problems of the homework that's due this Saturday, then you'll be fine. Then I think you'll be probably fine. Okay. All right. So, and then I yes. Sorry? You'll be doing them in, in lab on Friday. Okay? You'll be doing it in lab on Friday, and it will be, you know, you'll have, a, we're allotting about an hour for these things. So basically, we're, we're looking at very short, simple problems. Okay? And again, if it ends up being a total disaster, I'll, I'll figure out how to weight the grades accordingly for that. So, because um, I'm trying to figure out, I want, I want, I find it easier to err on the side of making these things harder because then you might surprise me. But if you know, but if you uh, you know, if it turns out to be a disaster, because I get surprised the other way, well, I mean, you only just did start programming, so. All right, so we're going to go into this. So the idea behind parameters is that basically, uh, suppose you have recipes, you know, this recipe for baking twenty cookies, right, and this recipe for baking four, uh, forty cookies, which simply says. All we do is that we multiply the amount of, uh, uh, of ingredients by two. Although they seem to really like their chocolate chips, having 40 pounds of chocolate chip cookies, because I have chocolate chips for 20 cookies. So these are some really uh, chocolatey cookies and expensive too. Um, so instead, what we should probably do is that basically is that we can, you know, if we see this relationship that basically we double the, we come up with one. You know that we have 20 cookies. Here's the recipe for 20. Here's the recipe for 40. We can come up with a, basically a way to uh, parameterize that to make it so that basically, if we get or if we're given n cookies, we want n divided by five cups of flour, n divided by 20 cups of butter, n divided by 20 cups of sugar, n divided by uh, 10 eggs, and then two n bags of chocolate chips. So we really does. He's really going all in on this uh, more chocolate than cookie kind of idea. Um, so a parameter is a value that basically allows us to do uh, different tasks. So we've seen these already. Uh, 
the idea here is that we've got the, suppose we want to print out these following lines and boxes. We want to print out all these lines. I think there's like 13 of them, and then 7, and then I think 35 of them, and then we want to print out these boxes that are very similar shape. Right? Rather than coming up with a single method that prints out 13 lines and one that prints out 7 lines, and then one prints out 35 lines, instead we can write the idea behind parameters that we've seen is that, right, if you've already, already watched my video on parameters, what we've seen is that we can make these a single method where it just prints out n stars, right? So the idea here is that main, when it needs to, it will call uh, a line method that instead of doing a line of 13, which draws, sorry, or a line of 7, which would draw 13 or 7 stars, it will call the line method and pass in some number, and then it will draw that many lines. So when we declare the variable, we, we sorry, when we declare a method, when we write the method, we're going to say that we it needs a parameter. And then when we call it, we pass in that parameter. So we've all seen this, and we've all been doing this in our homework, right? This shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. Um, this is the way that this method, that this looks like, right? This is how we write a method that takes in parameter. Public stack void, which we have no idea what this part means yet, but we're going to learn what void, what we mean by void today. Um, the name of the method, and then what parameter you'd like to put in. And then all the stuff you want to execute, just like any other method you put in here. So public stack void say uh, password in code. When say password is called, when you, you've got to pass in an integer, and when you do pass it into an integer, it will print out this code, right? It'll print out this, this stuff. So if I pass in 321, it will execute and say this password is 321. So if I call it over here in main, right, that previous method, say password is 42, it'll print out the password is 42. And then if I do say password 12345, it's going to print out the password is 12345. I'm going fast, but that's only because we've done this already, right? So everybody's cool with this? Okay. So we can pass in a So what we've been doing primarily in our work is that we've been passing in a parameter, and we've been using that to control the number of times a for loop will run, right? Here, this prints out just a salad a certain number of times uh, based on how many times you pass it in. So if we print in chant 3, it will print out just a salad three times. If we, print it, if we pass it in five, it would, the loop would run from one through five, which means this loop runs five times and would print out five stuff. So this runs one through times, number of times, so it'll print out times, number of times. Okay? When the method is called, the way this works is that the value is stored in the parameter value. Right, so three gets stored in here, and then the code executes using it. So right, when we go call chant three, this three gets passed over here in times. And then when we go, go seven, now time, but when we go to chant seven, this seven gets passed over into this value. Okay. So the common errors that you've probably come across and banged your head against is that you got to make sure you actually give it a value, right? And you got to make sure that the types match, right? It chant expects an integer number of times to pan, uh, right? It expects that basically you're going to print out just, just a salad n number of times. Here, if I pass it 3.7, well, it can't print out that value 3.7 times, right? It has to have whole numbers to deal with, all right? So here, here's that line method where basically we print out count number of stars, which you know is fairly easy compared to what we've been working on. Um, you can give these as many as you like. Uh, when we work on graphics, I, depending, we might get to that today, we might get to it Monday. Uh, you'll see that basically we'll be dealing with stuff that takes in four parameters, which all of them make sense because they all have a spe specific role to fulfill. Okay, so more parameters doesn't mean uh, harder. So here's one that basically uh, called print number, where it takes in a number and prints it count number of times, right? So here, if you look at this, this for loop runs one, the values of i run are one up to and including count. So if I passed in nine as count, the loop is going to be one through nine. 
And what it does is that prints out number. So 4, 9 will print out the number 4 nine times. That makes sense, right? The, everything, it, this number goes to here, count goes to here, right? It's, you don't, just because number is here and count appears first here doesn't mean that, you know, it mixes it up, right? So fours, so four gets printed out nine times, 17 got printed out six times, eight got printed out zero times, which makes sense, and zero gets printed out eight times. Okay. So um, what about the box method? So here's modifying a box method to print out a box of a given size, right? It says, let's start with a line that's as wide as the box, and we'll end with a line as wide as the box. So that takes care of two, uh, two of the line, right, two of the things that we have to deal with for a box of a certain height, right? So that's why we're going to subtract two over here. And then what we do is that we print out one column. So we print out a, let's see if I go over here, we'll print out a star, and then at the beginning and then a star at the end of the line, and in between all those things we have to print out uh, the width of the box minus two stasis. Right? So let's go through that in more detail. Okay? You've got a, um, let's see, you've got, sorry, let's go ahead and copy paste that out so that we can actually play with it. Okay? So you can see it. New. Class from slides. Okay, so we'll go ahead and write that. Oh, I should always remember to capitalize this. So I'll call this here. That gives me an error because now my file name doesn't match. So I'll just tell Eclipse to fix it. Put up. Okay. It also needs the line method, so we'll go ahead and copy that in. Because I want to, I really want to show you guys that it's going to work, and walk through that one with you. Because I know that you guys need as much practice with the nested for loops as you can get, because that really gets you thinking algorithmically. Traditionally, we've actually introduced that at the end because it's hard. We we uh, we reduce it. At, we, sorry, we like present it at like week five or six because it's harder. But really, you should. Uh, this book takes the strategy of, of showing you easy, of showing it to you earlier, because it gets you thinking algorithmically sooner. Okay? Right, so we've got our methods, we've got our box method. Right? Now, what this is going to do, say we get passed in a width of 2 and a height of, of 7. Sorry, width of, uh, let's actually not go with width of 2. Width of 5. So let's go with a width of 5 and a height of 7. Okay? So we're doing 5 and 7. So first thing, the first line, what it does is that it says we're going to print out a, a line that is width long, right? So let's go ahead and write that down. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm literally going through this loop basically like a computer would. I'm acting as the compiler here, right? Ne next it says four int line is one. H line is less than height minus two. Why is it height minus two? Because we're going to be printing a line here at the uh, at when we start it, and a line here when we end it. So two of the lines are taken care of, right? Already. So I'll go ahead and put in that. I'll go ahead and skip down here and pick out that bottom line, so we don't forget about it, right? So what is the height? The height was seven. So seven minus two. So this value over here is going to be five, for example. So the lines values are one through five, right? That makes sense to everybody. So this outer loop is going to execute five times, right? Does everybody follow why this outer loop runs five times? Okay. Now, each time this outer loop runs, it says, so let's go ahead and start with the first time this runs. The first time it runs, it says, print out a star. Okay? Then it says, uh, four inch I, so four inch space is one. Space is less than width minus two. Space plus plus. So this says, and then it says to print out a space. <coughs> we want to print out as many spaces as this thing is wide, so minus 2. Why minus 2? Well, because we've got a star here, and we'll have a star at the end. 
So we want one, two, three spaces, and then we'll put in, then it says put in a star at the end. Then we go to the next line and do the same thing. Put in a star, it says with, print out with minus two spaces, star, and go on to the next line. And then now we're at the fifth line, and we printed out our rectangle. Right? It's five wide and seven long and seven high. All right. So um, let's see. All right. Value semantics. So um, the idea here is that when we print, when we when uh, we pass stuff in. Uh, to these, so one thing that basically does get lost in trans, uh, that basically you might not have figured out just by doing this, is that when we pass a value in, we uh, copy that parameter. When we pass in a primitive, like an inch or a double, we're going to copy it. We're going to make a copy. So when we modify it, it's not going to change the way the the method runs. So it's not going to change after we execute. So this is new material here. Uh, let me give an example. So print. So public, static, void, um, modify, int x, or let's call it uh, try to modify because we're not going to modify it. But we'll say x is equal to x plus 1, right? So we're going to change the value. So we're going to take x's value, store it in x, right? And where we're going to take values x value, add one to it, and then sort it in x. System dot out dot print line method x. Okay, and then over here, I'll print out. I'll have a system. I'll have an int x is equal to five. And what I'll do is I'll copy paste this line over here, system dot print line, and I'll call it main x is the x value. Um, try to modify x, which will print out that one, and then we'll print out the value of x afterward. So we run this and it says the x in main is five. Then we pass it. We pass five to the method. We increment x by one, bring it to six, and we print it out. And we print out six. Then we ask to print out the value of x, and it says five. So this is something that sometimes that students think will will work because they just don't know the rule yet, which is that when we pass things in, like an int, a double, a character, if they're passed in as a parameter to a method, we copy their value. So, in other words, what we're going to do here is that, and this is very similar to what I wrote, we pass in an x over here. This, uh, so int x is equal to 23, print, pass x to here, increment x by 1. We'll get 24 in the method, but this doesn't change over here because we're the, the x over here is a copy. Does that make sense? They're copies of each other. So we copy 23 into the x over here. Make sense? So anything that you do over in the method when it comes to these primitive values, and that's important, anything we do to the primitives won't change what happens in anywhere else in the program. And this makes sense to you. It totally makes sense if I called x, y instead over here, right? Right? This seems to make sense to everybody that if I called this y and we pass it in over here, that it got passed into x, x is incremented by 1. This, this, does, this seems to make sense to everybody. But when I start using the same variables, people start getting confused sometimes. But the idea here is that the changes over here don't affect uh, the changes over here when it comes to primitives. Now, when we get to objects like arrays, you'll see that uh, that this cop, that basically that this copy rule does still uh, work just in a very different way, but things do manage to get changed. 
So as a result, one of the things that we'd love to do, um, because names are, because I can call a variable x over here or, and y over here, right? One of the questions we'd love to put in basically every single exam, including the final exam, the second exam, and your first exam, is a question like this. Parameter mystery, where I declare x, y, where I declare x, y, and z to be various numbers, right? And then I pass, mis then I pass them into mystery in the orders z, y, x, and then y, x, z. And then I ask you to print out this uh, the output. Then I ask what's the output of the problem, right? And here everything's ordered in x, z, y. So what the heck is this? What the heck are, is the answer? How do I figure this out? Well. Nine, so let's go ahead and go through this. X is nine, Y is two, Z is five, right? So here, we're saying I want to pass in Z, Y, X. So five, two, nine. So five gets copied from here to here, right? Even though it's Z here and X here, right? It doesn't match up like that. It matches up in the order they're passed in. Does that make sense to everybody? So five, two, nine. So X is five. Z is 2, Y is 9. So 5, 2. So the print line is over the first one, it's 2. And then 9 minus 5, which would be 4. So the answer here would be 2 and 4. Does that make sense to everybody? That basically that we pass stuff in the order they're passed in. So here Z, Y, X gives, uh, passes in 5, 2, 9 in that order. So now X is 5. 5, Z is 2, and uh, Y is 9. Great. I think I confused myself there. 5, 2, 9. Yeah, 5, 2, 9. X is 5, Z is 2, and Y is 9. Yes? Let me go ahead and just, so the idea, sorry, we have an animation here, I thought, but no, I thought I had an animation here. Um, so, glass. Parameter mystery. Sorry, what was the question again? It will print out in this case, like I said, uh, two and four, and then the second one prints out nine and three. Out dot print line first. Um, x system dot out dot print line z. And I'm printing it out in the order x z y because that's the order they're passed in. Okay. So let's go ahead and run this. So it first prints it out. In, so first, this method, first method call, we pass in five, two, nine, right? So x is equal to 2, z is equal, sorry, x is equal to 5, z is equal to 2, y is equal to 9, right? So the output is 2, and then it says y minus x, which was 9 minus 5, right? Now the next time, it, this time it gets it passed in the order 2, 9, and 5. So 9 was the middle one. So it prints out z, which is 9. And then it prints it out 5 minus 2. Does that make sense? The, this is hard for me to do too, right? It's actually pretty, uh, no, it's actually non trivial for pretty much every programmer. You don't just do it in your head, um, except when you've done lots and lots of practice. What I really, what you really need to do for these kind of problems is to write it down and, like, oh, well, you have these things there, so I'm just going to cross out the x and put you know, whatever variable got passed in, whatever number got passed in there, right? And that's how you solve these problems, by actually writing down what you have to do. Um, all right. 
So that's very much all we need to say about parameters. So let's go to continue on to the, to the next fun part. So we're going to talk about stuff that are a bit more detail about stuff that aren't parameters, which are strings. Right? We've talked about strings before, just not in great amount of detail. Uh, it's just a bunch of characters just glued together. And you can declare a string like in, in two different ways. The first way is that we can just say a string is equal to something in double quotes. Right? We can take a, a bunch of double quotes and assign it into that value. Or we can create an expression. Right? So we can do string addition, which is pretty much the only operation that we can do with strings that we've learned. Which is the, and that plus sign is actually called something called concatenation, which is just simply a fancy way of saying we glue stuff together. So here, open parentheses, glued together with X, then glued together with a comma and a space, glued together with Y, glued together with a closed parentheses. All that's just concatenation operations. And we can use, and we, and when I, my first examples were using strings as parameters, even though a lot of the problems didn't involve using strings as parameters. Uh, so it's public sag void main say hello to Marty. String teacher say hello Victoria. So here the say hello, you pass in you can either pass in a string literal, right? Literally just some text that you type in in double quotation marks. And it'll print it out, hello Marty. Or you can pass in a string variable, right? And it'll print it out and it'll print that out. So you can pass in either a string literal or you can bring, print out a variable that stores a string. That makes sense to everybody? Just like you could do that with an integer, you can pass in an actual number, or you can pass in a, you know, a string literal. Sorry, yes, you can pass in, sorry, just like a number, you can pass in a number, the actual number itself, or a variable, you can pass in the bunch of text, or the uh, variable. Um, so, We'll get into more detail on that because we've kind of learned how to use strings already with those regards. But now we need to look at the final thing that one of the more important things, which are return values, which is what the heck is that void doing in my uh, in my in my uh, method calls, and why am I writing methods anyway? Why am I not just doing everything in main, right? So the idea here is that we can package all your stuff together in a class. I can write a class of a bunch of methods, and then I can hand them to someone else, and they can use them. So let's go ahead and look at Java's math class. Um, and we're going to do that by actually opening up our web browser and looking at some source code. Java math class. So, um, so first off, this is a website you should probably bookmark at some point, which is the uh, Java API. Okay. And I would look at the Java API 8, 7 will still do. But basically, this is everything that's in Java. Everything that basically has been, uh, that basically is an official Java that, the, that Oracle has. Now, there's other stuff that other people have written in their own libraries. But this is the stuff that, if you install all Java, automatically comes with it. And it's a lot of stuff, including like stuff like uh, Scanner. Here's, right? Scanner and it just tells you all the things a scanner can do, right? Which is pretty useful stuff. Um, tells you all the kind of all the methods you can use in scanner. Today we're going to look at math, um, but I don't want to look at the API. I want to look at the source code, which you can do. Um, let's go ahead and look at the the raw file, right? So this is just so you got to remember that everything in Java. And I'm going to zoom in. Everything in Java was written by somebody, and it was probably written in Java. So, uh, but this is the source code for uh, for the class for the math class. It's a bunch of methods that are all math, just these nice math functions that you might that somebody might want to use. Now it starts out public final class math. This final just means that nobody can change it. Okay. I'll, we'll, we'll learn how that works later in the semester, but for right now, understand that this means that when you see a final, it means unchangeable. It's got some other stuff over here that you don't understand, like doesn't let anybody instantiate the class. What the heck does that mean? We'll get more later. But here they've got like, okay, they've got, this is weird, but it's E is equal to this value, pi is equal to this value, but 
then we start seeing methods, which are familiar. Uh, so public static double sign, double A, which calls another method. Let's go ahead and look at, um, let's see, the POW method. It uses a delegates to strict map. Interesting. So not too fun. But then you have other stuff uh, like this. Public static double max, double A, double B, which tells you whether A or, and it's got, it's a bit obtuse over here right now because it's using a lot of weird Boolean logic, but tells you uh, which one's bigger. Uh, which one is the, which one of these two, two numbers are bigger, right? It's a method somebody wrote. Which one of these two uh, integers are smaller? That's a method somebody wrote. Um, and you can understand that that's basically something we might want to use uh, because that, that seems like a common question, what telling whether a number another, uh, one or two numbers is bigger. Oh, converting a angle in degrees to radians, right? If you're working with circles, that seems like a useful function, right? And the idea here, though, is that we're, we probably don't want to figure out how to figure, how to code up the, how to calculate the arc tangent on our own, right? Or how to calculate even sine values on our own. That seems uh, tedious and boring, and then I'd have to remember all that stuff about trigonometry that I forgot somehow over the summer, right? So, uh, so the idea here is that when we write something, we can, in a class, we can make it reusable. So in your computer, uh, just stored somewhere, is a file called math.java. And it gets compiled, well, actually it's a math.class uh, file because it's already been compiled, just like all your code is already compiled. And now that it's been compiled, I can use it in pretty much any other Java program that I want. So let's go ahead. Uh, math example. And the way I can use uh, stuff in, a, uh, in another class, okay, is that I write the class name. So there's a class name is math, right? And then I do dot, and then I bring up the name of the method. So this one, ABS, is pretty straightforward. What does it do? It says, given a parameter, it will return, oh, there's a magic word, it will return the absolute value of something else. Okay. So math uh, absolute value of 7, it says the absolute value of 7 is 7, right? That makes sense. Absolute value of negative seven is seven. I'm not going to go anything right. Every, this is everything. I'm not going to really try to go too far above, you know, what you should have done in college algebra. Um, so, um, here's some of the more useful functions that we might find. Whoops. Of course, I completely go back in the middle of the slides. So, some of the more useful functions that we'll see are calculating the absolute value, calculating what's called the ceiling which is what happens if we take a give it a double and we round it up. That's the ceiling. So uh, if we passed in 3.3, we'd get 4 out. Okay? And I'm talking about like getting numbers out of a function, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, Math.floor rounds numbers down. Math.log10 gives me a logarithm, logarithm in base 10, uh, giving me uh, so the max and minimum, right? The larger and smaller of two numbers. Math.pow, this is how I do uh, exponentiation. I say the base to the exponent power. Math.random gives me a random number between 0 and 1, which is basically all I need because there's an infinite number of numbers between 0 and 1. It's true. Uh, Math.round, rounds, that rounds like we've been taught to round, right? Gives me the square root of something, calculate the sine, cosine, and tangent, stuff, take turn stuff to degrees or radians. And also there's constants. E and pi are stored in there. So the idea here is that we've got, we can call it, like I said, by doing math.method name. Right here, the square root of 121, let's go ahead and uh, grab these and run them in our own program. Right, double square root is equal to math.square root 121. Print out the square root. Absolute value of negative 50 should be 50. And then system.print line math.min 3, 7. So the smaller 3 and 7 plus 2. When we run those, we get values. So here's the interesting thing to notice about these methods that somebody else wrote that we call. And we 
And you may have noticed this when we were going through them. They don't have any print statements in them, right? They aren't printing out anything. Instead, a lot, a lot of them don't even have that word void in them. Instead, it says uh, it's public static double, right? Or public static uh, in two, when we're turning the deg uh, some radians to degrees, it, prints, it gives me a double back. It says double here rather than void. And as a return instead of a print. Okay. Um, so math methods, they don't print a constant. They instead produce a result. You can treat, you can think of them as a box, a black, a magical black box, because you don't actually need to know how they work, right? You don't need to know how they work. You just need to know what they do, right? You don't need to know how signs are calculated. You just need to know if you call, if you call math.sign, it's going to produce the sign of that, uh, of the value you pass in, right? I mean, you don't know how your calculator does a um, three times set, how it does multiplication. It's actually quite interesting how it does multiplication. You just know that if you type three times seven, it will multiply three by seven, right? You just need to know what it does. You don't need to know how it does. <laughs> but what these do is that they, but what they do is that they don't print. It returns a result to you. It returns something to you. And to, let's see if I can't draw something just really basic on the screen over here. Yeah. So think of a, fun, of a method that returns something as a box right over here. So this is my, uh, let's say this is the map.how method, which will raise something from the base, base to an x. Now, methods, they get passed in. The power method uh, gets passed in two parameters, right? If it, was had, if it had one parameter, I'd draw one hour. If it, had two, if it has two parameters, a base and a power, I'm drawing two. If it had five parameters, I'd draw five hours, and it'd get really crowded in there, OK? Um, but let's say I want to write, we'll do something pretty simple. Uh, five, this is the base, and then the exponent, Raised to the second power. Five raised to the second power. Now, if this was a void method, something that was like that, we would typically signify like giving it a print, um, uh, like in its name, like print exponent or something like that, or print out. It would it wouldn't have an output. It would just print something out to the console. But as you may have noticed, most of the programs that you actually use don't actually do like the programs you're writing right now. They don't they use the console. But most programs that we do on our, that we use on our computer, they don't actually stuff out to your computer console. That's just the way that all, most all the programs ran in previous years, in, in, old time, you know, in older times, uh, because everything was done on the console. You didn't have any GUIs. But these days, it's done on, it's stuff is, you know, changed on the GUI. Here, though, when we're sure, so most of the time, we want to get data back from this method. We want, we're passing data into this method. Returning is the way we get data out. So, Math.how, it will take 5 squared, and it will give me that value back. It will give me 25.0 because it's going to return to double. We'll give me, so, this, so base and exponent go in, and then the result comes out. You can only, now, the rule for returning is that you can only ever return one value out of a method. Okay? So you only get, ever get one value out of this method. That make sense? And now, once we get it returned to us, the nice thing about why do we want to not want to return it? Why not just print it out out in the method if we're going to print it out anyway? Well, we might not just do that. Here, we got the value, we got the return value, and we used it in an expression, right? We used the value here, which is the smaller of three and seven, and we added that to two. So here, we can store it for later, or we can reuse it if we wanted to. Um, so it's the way to think of it is, and that the way they describe it, think about it, and that's a pretty good way. It's the opposite of a parameter. You put, you push parameters in, you get the returned values out. So here, I'm sending negative uh, 42 into math.abs, and it's returning 42. Here, I send 2.71 to math.round, and it will return three to me. Right? I give it a value, it gives me something back. So, um, 
I'll write one in a second, but let's go ahead and just look at evaluating some of these things. So what's the val uh, absolute value of negative 1.23? Right, it'd be 1.23. Uh, the math.pal, three, uh, 3 raised to the second power, that's 3 squared, so this will return 9.0 because it's going to return a double. Uh, math.pal, 10 to the negative, uh, the negative second power. How do you figure that one out? What are negative powers, if you remember? It's the reciprocal, right? So it's be 1 over 100. Okay. Um, Math.square root of 121 minus the math dot square root of 256. So uh, 121 is, well, we learned that's 11. So what's the square root of 256? So 12 squared is 144. 13 by 13 is what? What's the square root of 256? I don't know off the top of my head. Think I know that kind of stuff? No, I use a calculator. Uh, so, so what? 16, yeah. You should know that one, though, because it's the power of two. As a power of two, get intimately start getting intimately familiar with them. So, so this would be 11 minus 16, which would be negative five. Math dot round pi, and so pi rounded and math rounded. Sorry, sorry, pi rounded and e rounded added together. So pi is 3.14 and change, right? So that gets rounded down. Whereas e, whereas e is what? Like 2.7, 2 right? 2.71 and change. So that gets rounded up. So it's 3 plus 3, so that's 6. Uh, Math.ceiling. Ceiling we, means we always round this up, right? So this gets rounded to 7. Math.floor means we always round out, so this gets rounded down to 15. Cool, we're doing great on time. And then this, so this would be 6 plus, so this would be 7 plus 15. Yes? Um, it depends on it depends on the prop on the one. Yes, it really just depends on um, what we use. But as a general rule, if I'm passing in a double, I'm going to get a double back. With integers, it's a bit less. It'll, it's a bit less. But one of the nice things about using an IDE to answer that question, because it is an important question, is that when I do math dot, it will start showing up here, and it might be harder for the people in the back to see. But it tells me like. Say I want to type in math.pal, right? I'm typing it in, and it comes up with helpful suggestions over here. And it says, double argument one, double argument two. And then it says, colon, double. And that lets me know it returns a double. The colon lets me know it returns a double. If I got, um, so if I was doing uh, math.sign, it lets me know that sign returns in a double, right? So this helps me know what, what, what happened from there. Uh, math.round. We know that if we pass in a uh, if we pass in a float, we'll get an int, and if we pass in a double, it's going to give me a long. So, okay. So some quirk again. So some quirks of real numbers is that again, if we do right what we were just talking about, math.pal, it need, you need to. Get it, you need a double to store it. Um, and then some double values, they're just not going to work out, right? 1.0 divided by 3.0, we can't capture an infinite number of threes, so it just prints out like you would in a calculator, right? And then I showed you this earlier where 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is not equal to 0 0.3. Instead, it's a bit of error because the weird stuff of how binary numbers are just stored in your computer. Um, now you can force a number into an. In, you can force a number to be treated as another number. Called the, this is called the typecast. Now this doesn't happen too often, but it's useful when we need to do when we do need to do it. Basically, we can tell an integer to be treated as a double, or we can tell a double and say throw out all this all the floating point parts, so that we can get a, a value from you. And it's type. And then the expression. So here, double result is equal to 19 divided by 5. Now, 19 divided by 5, that would normally get us 3. But here we have double in parentheses next to this. And what that double does, that turns that 19 into a 19.0. It says treat that 19 point as a, zero, as a uh, double, then divide by 5. 
So we get 3.8. Here the result was 3.8. We take this result, we tell it to be treated as an integer so we can sort an integer, and that throws out the 0.8. And then when we do math.pow, 10 to the third power, that'll return 1,000.0, but we, if we want to store that value in an integer, we can tell it to uh, store an integer. Now, this typecasting basically tells Java to ignore the error, right? It tells it to change it. And you're telling Java, you're basically promising Java that uh, you can trust me, I'm a programmer, I know what I'm doing. However, if you make a mistake, like you're trying to turn a string into an integer like that, Java will, it, it won't give you an error while you're compiling it, but once you run it, it's going to crash. Okay. So how do we actually return a value? Um, oops. Let's go ahead and write a very, very basic uh, method that re will return a value. Something even more basic. We'll go, then we'll come back here. Okay. Um, we're going to write something pretty darn basic. Okay. So let's go ahead and write our own basic math method that's so basic that we don't even need, that there doesn't even really need to be a method for it. Public, static. Right now, all we know to do is void, right? So we'll put that there, but we'll replace it later to show how to return a value. Add, right? So we're going to add int a and int b together, right? Now, the way we know how to do things so far is... Uh, to do system dot out dot print line, right a plus b. But most of the time, really, what we should do is that if we're printing out something, we should call it print add. So this is going to be a new rule that I want us all to follow from now on. Okay? If the method prints out, if the method isn't main and it's printing out stuff, you should call it print something, right, or draw something. If a method doesn't have print in the name, it shouldn't print out anything unless you're debugging it. Just checking to make sure it's working, right? If I tell you to write a method called add, I don't want it to print out something. I want it to return the value. If you want to print it out, print it out in main, right? So stuff should basically only be printed out in main for the most part. But this is just for a new rule for like the upcoming assignments, just to make things. Um, so unless I explicitly tell you to print something out, I want it returned. But I'll try to help you remind you in the labs. Okay. And again, this, this won't apply for your time lab. You won't have to remember for your time lab because this isn't what I'm testing you on on the time lab. What I'm testing you on the time lab is the stuff that we went over in uh, in the in the third lab assignment I gave. So public static void add a and b. So now if I want to return the sum of this, I would say return a plus b. Right? And this would pass the value the sum a plus b out of the program, uh, out of the method. Now, of course, this is giving me an error. It's saying that void methods cannot return a value. So this space over here is what we call the return type. If I want to return an integer out of this method, I put int here. Make sense? If I want to return a double here, I would put a double. If I would like to return a character, I'd put a character here. If I'd like to return, although here it says, that's an error because you can't convert from ints to characters. If I wanted to return a string here, I'd put string instead, right? This tells me that it's a public static method, and it happens to return a string, or it happens to return an integer, or it happens to return maybe a scanner, or it happens to return an object, which is something else we haven't learned about, right? But whatever we want it to return, we put it over there. Make sense? If we don't want the method to return anything, we put void, which is that word that, if we had a dictionary definition, was basically means nothingness, essentially, right? So if we don't want to put, if we don't want to return anything, if we just want, if we don't want our method to return anything, we just put void there. We want this method to return the sum of a and b. So we return a plus b. So now we can test it out over here by saying, uh, by creating an int sum is equal to add. Now add expects three, uh, expects two integers, so we'll pass in an integer and another integer. It's not going to work if I pass in, uh, you know, a double, because it says you need an integer and an integer, not an integer and a double. So the types have to match up, or they got to be able to convert from one to the other. 
So 3 plus 6 is the sum. And so now, the sum, uh, 3 plus 6 gets stored in sum. So now I can use it. So now we can do, uh, say, sum. We can print out the sum. It should be 9. And then maybe we can use something else like that. We can do sum minus 8, which would give us 1, right? Nine. So now we can use that sum in an expression. So this allows us to, like, break up a little every, uh, you know, break up something into steps by steps and, like, store all the little steps and then put them together if I needed to, if I was working on some big equation or something, rather than just trying to do it all at once. So another method is, like, over here. Uh, returning the slope of a line between two given points, right? One line, uh, so one point at x1, y1, and one at x2, y2. And to calculate the slope, right, what is it? It's rise over run, right? Everybody remember that? So the way you calculate the rise is subtracting the second point's y value from the first point's, sorry, subtracting the first point's y value from the second point's y value. So that's the, dis the, the rise. And the run is the, you know, the second point minus the first. So here, a point at 1, 3, and 5, 11, this will return 2.0 because 11 minus 3, that, mean we, that means we rose 8, and we, and we ran 5 minus 1, which was 4. So 8 over 4 is 2. Does that make sense? Other stuff we can do with this. Uh, calculate, uh, create a, a temperature converter, right? So public stack double, Fahrenheit to Celsius. Given the degree Celsius, we'll, do, we'll use the formula to calculate from, Fahr from Fahrenheit to Celsius. So degree Celsius is 5 ninths times the, the number of degrees in Fahrenheit minus 32, right? So we calculate that, we store it in degree Celsius, and then we return it. We could also, alter, just alternatively, just simply return this expression in its entirety, right? We don't have to store it and then return that value. We don't have to store it in a variable and then return it. We can just evaluate an expression and return it, right? Remember, this is an expression too. What it does is that it doesn't return the variable degree Celsius. It says, okay, what is the double being stored in degree Celsius? It's like, oh, it was whatever we calculated here. I'm going to return that value, right? Um, one common error is not storing the value, right? Many students incorrectly think that a return statement just sends the variable's name back to the calling method. So we see this a lot, but well, we don't see this a lot because we mention it. But basically, right, we go back to the slope method where basically the rise over run would be 2.0 over here. Um, actually, it would be, uh, no, one half, my bad. And we'd say, and it would say the slope is result. And the error we get is the result is not defined, right? Even though they said, I totally defined it over here. But this value only exists, this variable only exists inside this method, right? Variables only exist inside the method you create them in. So it's not getting stored. Instead, we have to store the value over here, right? When you, re when you return a value, you have to store it somewhere, right? Because just like the values get copied Remember, what's happening here when we pass in parameters? We co copy in a 0 here, we copy this 0 to, here, to x2, we copy this 6 to y1, and this uh, 3 to y2, right? So here, um, in this one, we are calculating a, um, you know, we pa copy in these values, and then this result, it gets copied out. Now here, we copy it out and we just don't store it anywhere. Essentially, it's us throwing a ball at somebody and actually there's nobody there. So they just, so nobody's there to catch the ball, right? Here, I'm throwing the, I'm, I'm copying out the value and passing it over and now there's some place to actually pass it, right? All right. So, so this, breaking up pretty nicely into like some uh, 20, 25 minute segments over here. And I might see if I can't actually split it up, uh, split up the video into those segments and upload them individually. But, um, but that's 
work. So, but it breaks up better when I do that. So let's go into now the last part of this, objects and classes. So we've been writing classes, um, and they, so we've been writing these class files, right? Public. So we're, we're just trying to elucidate what each of these things uh, mean, right? Uh, we have the void, and now we know that this main method, the reason it has void is that it returns nothing. And now we know that this is a parameter, right? It's a string, except it has this weird fiddly character after it, right? It has these brackets, as we call them, after it, which we don't need. We don't, we don't know, but we know this is the type. It's string brackets. args is the name of the parameter that's passed in. So main does receive a parameter. Right now, that parameter is, well, an empty array, but we'll get into that. Uh, void, and we know that main now returns nothing. It doesn't return anything. And then it happens to be public and static, and we don't know what that means yet, but we'll, I'm sure we'll get there. Um, so now, what is a class? Um, so classes are either just programs, which is what we're doing right now, or modules. Basically, they're just something with the main method that we run, right? That's what a class is for us right now. The other thing a class can be done, used for, which is once we figure out all the basic stuff of programming, which is the first half of the semester, we'll write, be writing our own, our own classes, which are types of objects, which are basically their instructions on, on computers on how to build your data types, right? Right now, what we've learned how to do with, with these methods, right, is that we're learning how to add new commands to our programming language, right? We've added now an add command to our programming language. Whenever we add a new parameter, we're adding a new command, we're basically adding a new verb, basically a new thing that our program can do. Okay, we're adding a new verb to the language. The other thing we can do is that if we can add verbs, we can add nouns as well, right? And it turns out nouns are a bit more complex than verbs because nouns can perform the actions that are verbs, right? That's what makes nouns so, so uh, you know, you think of that from that perspective. So those nouns are objects. And classes can be used to define objects. And if we're using, so if, com new, if writing new commands are the verbs, then new, writing new data types, like strings or scanners, are the nouns. So a class is a blueprint or a template for constructing these nouns or these new objects. So one of the things we'll be learning about, which is the graphic stuff, which is gets fun because the graphics are a fantastic way to, show, uh, to showcase these. Um, the drawing panel uh, type is a template for drawing a lot of these drawing panel objects, which is basically meaning it's a way to draw windows on your screen. Um, Java has thousands of these classes. We're going to start writing our own much later in the semester. Uh, but Java is what we call an object-oriented programming language, which means that basically when we program, Java is nice in that we can program without using object-oriented programming. We can just do methods and have methods do things. But we can, uh, when we do, when we write really big projects, what makes Java nice is that we can define it in terms of how these nouns interact with each other, right? We define the program in and basically creating the new nouns and then listing all the verbs these nouns can do. And then we just define it in how they interact with each other. Basically, we try to tell a very basic, we try to tell a story, essentially. So an object is a entity that contains uh, data and behavior. So it's basically the data is the stuff that's stored inside of it. So it's more, so a noun has certain, you know, attributes. You might think of these as other nouns or other adjectives that describe the noun. And then they have their own, then each noun has a certain set of things that they can do. Like one thing that I can do is that I can type on a computer, but I can't fly. That's not a method that's defined, right? Okay. Um, the way we interact with these methods, we, uh, that's hidden from us a lot of the time. And we've, the way we build these new objects is that we say the type then we give it a name, right? So we so to be normally like say int x is equal to five. Well, for creating a new object, we say like a scanner, we'd say scanner keyboard is equal to new scanner, and we pass in the parameters, and then we call object names. So, um, but before we get in, into the deep dive and like trying to remember all this stuff and all the rules, uh, we're going to deal with a special type of object first, which is called a string. And the reason they're special is that we use them so bloody often that Java lets us uh, skip the whole 
but uh, this whole syntax right over here, the whole new syntax, let us treat them like primitives almost. So they are a bit easier for us to use. use. But they are a collection, but they are objects, right? Ints can't do anything. They're just data. Strings, on the other hand, you can do things with them. You can, uh, you know, they have this data stored in them. And they also have uh, methods that we could do. So the way strings work is that they store a bunch of characters in what are called indices or indexes. I pronounce them indices. Uh, so let's go ahead and say string name is equal to R. Kelly, is there example? It's a bit dated. Um, so index is equal to zero. So basically we have um, R. Kelly is stored at index zero. The, sorry, the R is stored at index zero. The period is stored at index one. Space at index two. K at index three. E, L, L, Y. And so we store all these characters in what we call indices. Basically, in memory what happens is that we've got essentially a block of memory allocated, meaning that we've just said that we need uh, we need eight characters to store R. Kelly, and we're storing them all next to one another so we can easily find them, right? And so this is, but each individual character is its own atomic unit. Each one of these individual characters is a character, right? So we can look at each of these individual characters. So the first character, the first indice starts at zero. So indexes in, in Java, they start at zero, just like in Python, right? If you're coming from Python and you dealt with lists at all, this should be slightly familiar that these things start at index zero. Now there's eight characters in here. The last index is the length of the string, minus one, right? So this is eight long, minus one, so it's zero through seven. So we can do some things with these strings. So I'll go ahead and start showing that off here. Okay, so new class string example. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a new string. We'll call this string uh, course is equal to CIS 21, sorry, 1068. Right? So this has, this string has also eight characters. And the indexes are, the C exists at index zero, index one is I, index two is the capital S, the space is index three, and then so on and so forth. Right? Now there's some cool things we can do this, uh, that we can do with strings. Uh, to um, course dot to lowercase. So these things have methods attached to them. And the way we can use them is by typing the name of the string and then putting a dot. And that will bring up all the list of these actions that the string can perform. Just like we could use math dot to bring up all the list of the methods that a uh, that a, that the math class can do. String has its own methods. Each individual string has its own method. Course dot to lowercase. As you might imagine, it'll print out. It will return. What this does is that it takes the string and gives me a new string with everything stored in lowercase. Right. So now the CIS is lowercase. So now I can, if I, as you might imagine, I can also do dot to uppercase, which takes it the string and returns a new string raised to uppercase, right? So lowercase, then we transform it to uppercase and it'll give me the uppercase back, right? Of course, if I do look up, uh, upper, if I do all lowercase to lowercase, right? It's not actually going to do anything. It just gives me a new string. It just happens to be the same as that string, right? It doesn't change anything. Okay. 
So far, so good there. We, what other interesting methods do we have here? We can find what the length of the string is. Okay, string, uh, so int length is equal to course dot length. And this tells me how big the string is, right? How many characters are in the string? How long is it? Which is actually really useful. So this gives me the length of the string, eight. Another cool feature of doing this is just to the print line um, is what we call the substring operation, which I'll get into more detail um, in a bit, but I can do course dot substring. And what this does is that it gives me a smaller section of the substring. So basically I want all the stuff starting after character four, starting at character four. So it gives me 1068, which is all the stuff starting at character four. Right? If I told it to start at 3, it would give me the space and then 1068. If I told it to start at 2, it gives me all the start stuff starting at indice 2, which is the S, and everything after that. There's also some more interesting things you can do with that, which will get uh, there because you can add a second parameter, but I'll jump back on that. And then the other one. If I were to say, well, what are the most important methods for that you're going to need to know immediately? It's the length to calculate. And this one, and this one. System dot out dot line. Uh, let's see. Let's see. String. So let's see. Car. First car is equal to us. Uh, course dot. So now we have a character at, which given the index of a, of a character, gives me that character. So index of zero gives me the very first character, which is a capital C, right? Is equal to course dot car at one. So the second character, that's located at index one, right? I know that gets really weird, so sometimes I'll call this one the zeroth character, then the first, and then the second, because we start at index zero. You might be wondering why the heck that is. I'll get into it, but it has to do with uh, basically the way that uh, it has to do with the computer's ease and convenience and the way we like to write for loops, which is that I really like writing my for loops when they start at zero. All right, so C, I, okay, let's go ahead and figure out though. Um, we know that the last character is equal to um, course. So the first character is always gonna be at index zero. The second character is always gonna be at index one, right? But what about the last character? Well, for this, for CIS 1068, we know that the last character is at, um, since it's got eight characters, right? Then the method, then the values, are, the indices are zero through seven, right? So the character at seven is the last character. So if I want to print out uh, the last character instead over here, so eight, okay? Um, note that basically I can't. If I put in eight here, I'm going to get an exception. It's going to tell me an error. It says your index is out of bounds. The string index is out of range, right? Because eight, the, the eight index doesn't exist, right? So I went off the sides, right? So the only values, I, the only values for that string I can use are zero through seven. Similarly, if I try to go less than zero for some reason, like, and that happens sometimes if I accidentally subtract too far, it's going to tell me that negative one is out of bounds. Okay. But, so seven will get me the last character right now. Unless, of course, I change the string. And 
And now that's actually a pretty long string. So how can I calculate, what can I do to figure out where the last character is no matter what I type in there? I'm going to have to use some kind of expression. So let's think about this for a second. This string is, well, I don't need to count it, actually. I don't need to count how long it is because it will tell me, right? Course not length tells me how long it is, right? Um, let's just go ahead with uh, caret zero for right now so I can run this. It tells me that it is 26 characters long, right? So we know that the valid indices are what? What are the valid indices? Zero through what? Zero through 25, because the last valid index is always, however big the string is, minus one, right? So we can use that information right over here. We can use, uh, let, we can use the length, which we calculated up here, minus one to figure out where that last character is, which is the n over there. And now we can print that out. Length minus one, right? Or if I haven't stored that already, I can use, this looks a bit weird, course.length. Right, I've got a course.character. Right, but again, this is just an expression and it's evaluated the same, day with, same way with PEMDAS, which is you do everything in parentheses first, right? So there's nothing in parentheses in here because this is a method call that doesn't take any parameters, right? So now we calculate the innermost, the next innermost set of parentheses, which is course.length minus one. What is course.length? It's 26. Minus one is 25. So get me the character at 25, at index 25. That making sense to everybody so far? So we've got 25. I know it might be uh, going up over the heads, but uh, over some people's heads, but that's okay. We're going to review this a bit more and especially do some work on this on, uh, in the upcoming um, classes. Um, let's see. Next, we need to, uh, let's see. So next, let's go ahead and finish off this lecture by doing something that uh, the most co uh, a very common operation, which is printing out basically every string, sorry, every character of the string one by one on its each line, on each line. So to do that, we're going to need a for loop, right? Because we don't know how long a given string is going to be, right? But let's go ahead and write a for loop. So for, now most for loops we've been starting at int i is equal to one, right? But here, we want to go over, basically what we want to do is we want to print out each character at each index, right? So what are the valid indices? It starts at zero, right? So we're going to start our for loop this time at zero, because zero is the valid indice. Okay? And we're going to go one by one. So that, that last part, going one by one, is the same. And what we're going to want to do is that we're going to want to print out, and yes, we'll figure out the middle part because that's the hardest part, in a bit. Print out course dot character at i. So we want to print out the ith character. So car i car is equal to character at i, right? So I'll break it up because it's easier to read this way, especially since we're starting. Okay, print out that ith character. So now we need to figure out what is the last valid indice, right? The valid indices are, in this case, are 0 through 25, right? So we put less than or equal to 25. So i is less than or equal to 25, right? So this would print out everything from 0 to 25 inclusive. Now, this works great for what we have right now. But if I were to change this and just remove the rosins, now, once I get to the apostrophe S, yes, it goes out of bounds, right? So we want to make this work for however long this character is. So how long the string is. So we know that uh, that um, if we do course dot length, that will give me however long the character is, right? This will give me 26 in this case. 
26. But what I need is to stop before I get to 26. So I could either do minus 1 over here, but because, so, but because we, that seems a bit lengthy to do a minus 1 over here, instead what we can do is that we can remove the equal sign over here. So this is the other form of the for loop. Right now, previously we've been doing i, you know, i is equal to 1, and then i is less than or equal to some number. And then it would print out 1 to none inclusively, right? Right, this is what that, uh, right, how many of you remember this, this notation from, uh, from math? That this is 1 through number inclusive. Right? So when we start at a number is equal, at i is equal to 0, and we go i is less than uh, some number, what we're saying is that we want uh, to go through 0 up to but not include number. So it's 0 through number exclusive. Right? which is actually turns out to be the normal way that we do things. This is the majority of the way you'll do things in computer science and in classes. But for me, but for the first, when we start out, especially in the first couple of lectures, it's easier to do one through this number. What's interesting to note is the number of values that this, that this has, right? How many values does this have? This one has num different values in it, right? It's one through number, up to an including number. This one also has num values. So if you do a for loop either number of these way, either of these ways, it's going to run not the same number of times. Because while it's not including zero, sorry, while this one's not including number in it, it now did add zero. So that's one more additional number to go through. So now let's go ahead and run this. And now this will print out whatever. I put in there. Uh, it prints out one of those, those one at a time. So, all right, let me go ahead and discuss the timed lab. So you'll have 60 minutes on the timed lab, um, and you know, so we're gonna we're gonna try to budget basically 10 minutes of problem for those. So we'll probably do five, four problems at most. So then you'll have 20 extra minutes to make sure that you've got plenty of time to turn it in. Now you need to make sure you turn it in before the lab ends. Even if it's late, turn it in. We'll, we'll see how, how bad how badly that needs to be, you know, what, what what late penalty there will be, but turn it in in something rather than nothing. You can't turn it in once it closes, so you gotta turn it in before the before it closes. Uh, you also need to att attend your lab section. So if you're assigned to the one o'clock, you've got to attend the one o'clock here at the 11, you got to go to 11 o'clock. So. In addition, you'll also be getting some problems, and we're going to take some time on, on, on Monday, hopefully, to work on, on, on some of those. Um, and then, so basically, I'll give you two sets of problems. You'll be getting two PDFs, one of which you'll be expected to work on in the lab and on your own, and the other one will do in class. Okay? And that will be worth uh, 50 points. And again, if you're in the Japan section, follow along as best you can, um, but it's essentially just, you know, uh, 50 points of the homework that you'll turn in at normal time, so uh, you'll see when, you'll, so it'll all get posted on, on um, Monday, and be prepared to work with the partner again on Monday, okay? So I'll post some more videos, and I'll see you on Monday.